Hello. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ranjan. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm honored to be talking to you. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, before we dive into our conversation, I would love to read your introduction for my Indian viewers. Sure. Well, Steve Chandler is one of America's best-selling authors whose 40 books have been translated into more than 20 languages throughout Europe, China, Japan, and Latin America. Chandler is also a world-famous public speaker who has been a guest on hundreds of radio and TV shows and recently starred in an episode of NBC's Starting Over, the Emmy Award-winning reality show about life coaching. Chandler was recently named to the uh, faculty at the University of Santa Monica where he teaches in the graduate program of soul-centered leadership. Chandler's first audiobook, 100 Ways to Motivate Yourself, was named Chicago Tribune's Audiobook of the Year in 1997. Uh, King Feature Syndicate repeated the honor by naming Chandler's 35 Ways to Create Great Relationships, the 19, 1999 Audiobook of the Year. Chandler has been a trainer and consultant to more than 30 Fortune 500 companies worldwide. He graduated from the University of Arizona with a degree in creative writing and uh, political science and spent four years in the US Army in language and psychological warfare. Steve Chandler, the godfather of coaching, welcome to the show, Moments with Masters. And I am honored, honored to have you on my show, Moments with Masters, and you are the master of the day, Steve. Well, thank you. I, uh, I'm flattered and honored to be with you, Ranjan. Steve, thank you so much. And uh, my another thanks is actually for uh, accepting my invitation to be the keynote speaker at the Ultimate Experience India, uh, which we created on 25th of Feb. And it was a grand launch with your talk. I was very happy to do it. You know, um, Steve Hardison has made such a difference in my life. I was happy to be able to do that. Thank you. Yes, Steve, and I would actually love to uh, love to start with something that we have learned about you from the Ultimate Coach. So I would keep. Uh, uh, generally, I do not have agendas for the conversation because the agenda develops and unfolds through the authentic conversation that we are having. And but somehow we are having the Godfather of Coaching on this conversation. So I was like, let let me have something uh, that that I would love to learn about. And there must be hundreds who must be waiting to learn about these few things from you in the, through this conversation. So first thing, uh, Steve, uh, you know, this one chapter has, uh, I would say, you know, you already were known to many in the world of coaching and personal transformation. But this chapter, chapter number 18 in this, Steve Chandler uh, brought you closer to us and, and, especially coaches worldwide, closer to our hearts in a very different way. It became a learning experience to learn your journey uh, with Steve Harrison. And there's something very particular I would like to start with where, you know, it's uh, in the second paragraph, uh, it's written like, whenever Chandler spoke, Hardison attended to your talks. And afterwards, he would give Chandler feedback. And the most valuable was don't try to be Dennis. Your resume and your experience don't support it. Be you. So I would I would actually love to listen and learn more about your journey with through this being you uh, and your to be more of who you actually are and to be always be connected with your authentic self. And I would love to know more about your exploration of being you, Steve. Yes, well, I had a, a problem when I started speaking to groups in that um, my past 
was a disaster. I had um, bankruptcy. I had divorce. I had alcoholism. I had, um, and I was trying desperately with loads of debt to raise four children on my own. I had full custody of four children. Uh, their mother had been institutionalized and uh, had a brain disorder. And so I was totally lost and I was full of fear. And here I was speaking to successful people, trying to teach them how to be successful. And I was, I was not successful. And I was um, trying to be, I was trying to be Dennis, who was our lead speaker, a very successful man from the, from the moment he was in uh, diapers, he became successful. And I, on the other hand, was a failure at, at what I had done. So Steve Hardison um, showed me the authenticity of just being who you are. And so I changed my whole approach and I would come out and talk about my failures. And then I would talk about what it was that turned that around for me, what it was that gave me hope in a new life, which was the coaching I received from Steve Hardison mainly because he could see, he could see potential and possibility in me that I couldn't see. I was trapped in the ego, and he sees beyond the ego, he sees total being of a human being, especially potential and possibility. And that's what changed my life, my time with him. So, so uh, in addition to this coaching journey with Steve Hardison, uh, you know, how, did, how did that impact on you being you uh, impact all these years, Steve, in your professional life, in your personal life? Well, it, it led me to developing a spiritual journey. And um, when I recovered from alcoholism, I went into a spiritual program that had that felt very religious to me and very orthodox Christian religion, which I had uh, I had abandoned uh, early in my life. And I didn't know how to make it work because it had spiritual components. And someone gave me a book by Yogananda called Autobiography of a Yogi. Of a yogi. Yes. That book yes. changed my life years ago and, you know, about 25 yes. years ago. Mine like, too. I, I got initiated in Kriya Yoga in 1998. Oh, wow. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it changed my life because wow. it gave me a context for spirituality that uh, went beyond religious order, orthodoxy and cultism and um, shame and punishment it went beyond that. And so I began to pursue that level. And Steve Hardison uh, encouraged everything I did as far as my spiritual path. And so that was, well, that was a big part as well. So that began to be integrated into my coaching so that being being you was paradoxical being me there was no me the me that i was was created and what i learned on the spiritual path is personality is created it is it's not permanent and lately neuroscience has confirmed what the great spiritual sages and meditators over the years have taught us that the brain has neuroplasticity and you're not stuck with a pers permanent personality coming out of childhood, which used to be the, uh, the teaching of the old psychology was that our personalities are formed in childhood and we are, 
we are stuck with it. And mm -hmm. uh, But that's not true. And I've seen so much experiential evidence of that in my years, and that's that's the glory of um, the work that I was able to do through Steve Hardison's encouragement was tell your story and talk about impermanence and and the possibility of change, and and that's what I did, Steve. Uh, yeah, I you know every time I call you Steve, I have been talking to Steve Hardison so many times every next day that, you know, whenever I call you Steve, I, I know his face comes to my mind. And uh, Steve, the second thing that I would love to learn from you is also something very significant. Uh, you know, I've been talking to coaches across the world and these are these are some some topics which are from the chapter, but you know them. Uh, much better than many in a way that you have experienced that through the help of Steve Hardison. And the, the most next important thing that I found is when he tells you, uh, you know, that I can't tell you your value. He says that I can't tell you your value. You have to determine that yourself. Then deliver on that value you set. If I were you, I would charge $40,000. And, and this was regarding, I think, uh, the uh, training uh, that you were about to give. And he was asking you to charge, uh, you know, he was saying that you will uh, $1,250 yourself to death. <laughs> yeah. So, so the basic idea is that, you know, you set your value and then you deliver on it. And but there is something about you owning your value and you owning your worth. So we would love to, I would love to learn about your journey, you know, coming from that background. Sometimes I found it very difficult. You know, I've been a single parent for last six, seven years and raising two kids and uh, two bad divorces and, and uh, all at, at the same time, you know, you have, you have a long spiritual journey with so many spiritual practices and, and on the, on this side, on the material side, you, you failing on many fronts and this, this eats away, at, you know, at your energy and, and you feeling that, oh, I don't deserve that. I don't, des I, I don't, I'm not worth maybe this happy life, which many others are living on. They said, I am a good coach. I'm a good trainer and a speaker, but on personal front, there are many issues and Many of us have that. So this eats away at our personal worth, self-worth, which starts reflecting in the professional life as well sometimes. And we start connecting everything to our personal value. And so I would love yeah. to learn about your journey of owning your worth. Yes, I had to depersonalize in many ways the power of the work so that I wasn't taking things personally. And um, I was, if somebody said, no, I don't want to use your work, I wouldn't take it personally as if they were saying, no, you are not worth spending time with. I had to get over that. I had to get over self-consciousness and uh, the, little, the little me that we think we are, the little ego inside, trapped inside the skull uh, against a difficult, unfair world. I had to get out of that story. It was, it was just a story. It wasn't accurate. And I had, when that $40,000 per day training I did, I had to understand, and Steve was the one who pointed me to the understanding that this company had millions and millions of dollars at stake. And um, to train them to change their way of thinking from pessimism to optimism and from um, self-consciousness to um, service mindset and to take ownership of the company mission and to... Um, not be not think of themselves as victims every day that may the difference that was made through the training was so great that the forty thousand dollars looked small 
uh, compared to what then the ripple effect of what went out. So I had to start getting over taking myself seriously and ta- and being um, having little me against the world. And I had to, over time, fall in love with the work, fall mm-hmm. in love with the difference that the work makes, the difference mm-hmm. that training and the teaching and the coaching make make a big difference in people's lives. And that's what they're paying for. Um, They're paying for the difference that the work makes. And I had to own all the study and practice I had done to learn all these different systems of coaching and teaching and then to make them make them my own, give them my own interpretation and my own language. Hmm. Uh, I had to recognize uh, not from ego, but from from value. So different than ego. Ego is a self-conscious little old me, and oh, I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed. And uh, understanding value of what is being delivered through this human, mm. vehicle, human vehicle. I'm an instrument of uh, higher power. And, and so the little personality doesn't matter anymore and i don't somebody says no or i don't want your work and i had a woman the other day say you are you are fraudulent or something she posted on uh on facebook i don't take it personally um what does that have to do with the value of my work nothing Mm. steve you know uh, i I see the other side of owning your value uh, the other side of that is communicating your value uh, yes. to the world so so uh, can you t- can you help us understand about communicating your value whether it's to your clients or to companies or organizations people uh, how can one uh, develop and improve upon that skill of communicating your value yes uh, for for me my uh, what worked for me was to understand um, that communicating the value of the work I do and the skills that have been developed is a service to to people. Because if they don't know, then they're unable to access it and unable to receive help. Mm. And here, and if I'm over here. Um, nervous and shy about what people will think of me if I say my sem- this seminar is powerful, mm. uh, then I'm confused about service. It is a greater service to tell someone this work is powerful. It has helped many companies change their culture. It might help yours. Let's find out. Give me a chance to demonstrate. Now, that is greater service than if I say, oh, I don't know, some people think my work is good. I I don't want to brag. I don't want to look like I have a big ego. Inappropriately, personally, what we're really talking about is transformation and change. So if I arrive at a village and people are starving of thirst, and I have water, I don't want to be shy about the water I have. I want to let everyone know I have water. Who who needs it? But if I'm sitting there thinking, I don't want them to think that I'm bragging that I have water and they don't have water, what will they think of me? Uh, That's inappropriate. That's not not serving. And, And when I finally understood that, it was easy to talk about the power of of whatever work seminar coaching and because i saw it as a service to the people who were hearing the communication does that make sense or yes. am i yes 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 am absolutely. i going off am no I <laughs> absolutely off rails? no absolutely absolutely steve uh steve now, the, now 
this is this is again something very close to what we were discussing and one that people attach it to their personal value is money and you had you had your own journey of changing your relationship with money and and you know steve hardison helped you do that if i'm right uh, uh, to a large extent and uh, so uh, it's it's very easy sometimes you read a book and and you make your own interpretations to oh steve chandler this is how steve hardison helped steve chandler and steve chandler uh, changed his relationship with money but i want to learn from you like about that journey of what all went into and how did you change your relationship with money it could not have been just like that or maybe it's my belief system so help me understand that process you know how did what all went into changing your relationship with money well what happened over time through through coaching was um i let go of all my emotional attachment to money so i had a lot of anger around money i had a lot of fear around money and what steve hardison taught me what it's only money what are you doing um being so afraid it's it's a number it is mm. access to your work so if i give someone my phone number my heart doesn't start pounding oh i'm afraid to say this number uh when i get to the number 6 i'm so terrified uh i just give my phone number and that's that's your access to me you can call me by putting that number in and the same is true with money for um my work if you want my work you can hire me by putting putting that number in to paypal or whatever it's just a number and you don't have to pay i'm not taxing you i'm not stealing or taxing i'm not taking mm. the you are you, it is your decision you have to decide whether the work we will do has enough value for you to pay me the money so i i released my emotional irrational mental illness emotional fears and worries and around money mm. and money is a means of exchange it's a way um i exchange my energy with your work energy and um and it's very functional it wor it works it helps feed my children i was a single dad with four children and they were demanding they wanted food they wanted clothing they wanted shelter and who knows what's next uh and so i had to wake up and release all these child childish fears and make money uh more of a a function a practical function of my work and once it became depersonalized and it was just a function like a uh, a pen or a this is this is only a pen i don't start breathing heavily and uh, hyperventilating when i see a pen it's it's used to write with mm -hmm. uh why, why do i do that with money and the answer was i had a lot of old beliefs and fears and uh that i really had been afraid to confront and delete and let go of and that was it and it can happen for anybody over time belief systems um can be deleted and removed um from the over time uh with a uh, more rational reality based um understanding mm -hmm. so, uh, when i when i listen to your voice and when i listen to some of your videos and some of your talks that i've heard and uh, uh you know steve i see that 
through this journey of coaching, I have, I have experienced this and somehow I feel that you also, I have a feel that you also have experienced a, 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 an experience in your own self-actualization and your own, your own journey of that spiritual uh, transformation that you undergo through this profession of coaching. Uh, I would love to learn about the connection between in your life, like connection between coaching and your personal evolution as a person. Well, before, before I met, before there even was such a thing as coaching for the average person, coaching um, years ago was was in the field of sports or in, in specialized field of entertainment. There was a uh, dialogue dialect coaches for actors and dance coaches and coaches in sports for football, but there wasn't coaching in regular life. There was psychotherapy and that was your option. Or you could get a business consultant who simply gave advice. Uh, before there was coaching, I found a psychotherapist after I recovered from alcohol whose books I loved. And his name was Nathaniel Brandon. And he wrote many best-selling books on self-esteem. And I read those because I didn't have any self-esteem. I had very little. And uh, I was um, really shy and introverted and embarrassed about it myself and um he my life when he said uh, you must be what you teach you have to become what you teach you can't just learn it theoretically and teach it because that won't have an impact that won't that won't really touch people where they live they you have to live it you have to um you have to co coach yourself first and and pass through money fears relationship problems fears raising children you have to have that experience to be able to teach it and have the teaching really be and that was a big lesson for me so the coach is the only profession that I know where you have to keep improving. You have to have your own journey. You have to have self-development going on to be effective. Now, yes. if you're a lawyer, you can have a terrible personality full of ego and anger. But if you're a good lawyer... People will hire you. They don't care what your personality is like. They don't care who you are, what your character is. If you can win the case, I'll hire you. Same with a brain surgeon. You can be an awful person, bad character, cheating on your taxes. But if you can operate on my brain and save me, uh, um, we will. I want you. I don't want the to. Don't require a personal journey or a spiritual journey where um, you're continuously learning. Yes, so yeah. brain brain surgeons, coach, and lawyers, we don't care what they're who they are. We don't care uh, whether they are authentic, kind, compassionate. We care only about their skill. But a coach, it's the only profession I know of that requires the, the purveyor of the profession to continuously learn, grow, um, have a spiritual journey as well as a professional journey, getting better all the time. And uh, that's a beautiful thing. It's it's intimidating at the beginning because, oh, no, not me. I'm not going to. Do I have to go through a, 
a journey, a redemption, a purging of my old habits, that'll be too hard, but it's a beautiful part of the profession. Yes, Dave. Uh, Steve, you you have been professionally into coaching, like how many years, uh, roughly? Uh, 30, roughly. 30, roughly. In the last few years, with a with lot of AI and automation happening and, you know, a lot of email marketing stuff and digital marketing stuff going around. And you, you have seen all the different eras of this transition of the coaching world. What major changes have you seen and what still stays the same? I would love to listen from you. I think what stays the same is um, for a coach to be successful, he or she must be able to demonstrate the value of the work, not just promote it or advertise it or market it, because coaching is an intimate, trust-based profession. So the, those initial conversations, those uh, have to be, that remains the same. Coaches cannot get away with marketing themselves into financial success. It just doesn't work over time. Eventually, and you have to have the conversation that creates the trust, the rapport, that leads someone to want to work with you or refer people to you. So that hasn't changed, even though the media for communication keeps changing, as you said. But the basic idea, um, I need to be able to demonstrate for someone what this is and why it works. And I need to be willing to do that. Come talk to me. Um, can, people ask me, can your coaching help me. And I say, I don't know. I, how would I know if my coaching can help you? I don't know. I don't say, oh, yes, my coaching can help anybody. Uh, it's wonderful. I don't care. I don't. That's not true for me. Some people, uh, it doesn't help. So let's talk and find out. So, so the willingness to um, not be afraid of other people, not be afraid of real conversation, and try to hide behind electronic conversation where you don't have to be afraid of someone punching you for saying something offensive. Uh, it's That hasn't changed. But the media of communication keep changing, and that's fine. I'm not afraid of that. That's the impermanence of the world that we meditate upon and learn to welcome. Yes, Steve. Uh, another important element of impact uh, on, on the clients, which we have been learning from Steve Hardison and many other coaches and through your books and through your work and through your life is the coaching agreement. We would love to learn what, what has, has your understanding of having a coaching agreement changed or, or or how would how would you want the world to understand the power of an agreement a coaching agreement and especially the coaches uh, applying this understanding of having a coaching agreement and should it always be a written agreement or can it be uh, something just bit, just an understanding between the coach and the client yes that's a matter of professional choice. Uh, many coaches have a written agreement. Um, I don't. Our agreement is reflected in email exchange. Uh, you understand how many hours. And then in the verbal, um, my agreement is I will give you the best coach how to give and deliver the amount of hours that I um, have promised you for for our work where where some coaches get lost in this is they imply that they will 
help a client reach a worldly goal um, in a short amount of time. Like if a client says, I want to make uh, a million dollars next because sometimes clients show up and they say, oh, I'm so busy, I don't even know what I want to talk about. Uh, well, that is a condition called too busy to succeed in life. And people make themselves so busy, their chances of succeeding at, they, at what they want to succeed at are very low because they keep themselves busy by being unable to no to anything or anyone. So how how important, Steve, it is for a coach to to help his uh, to help his client understand the impact of having an agreement? Yes, agreements are very, very important. And the first agreement is between client and coach. We will keep our word with each other. I will tell you in me show so give you the best coaching I know how, and I will be committed to what you are committed to. And that's the journey we will be on. What I need your agreement on is you will show up on time. You cancel sessions, and you will show up prepared to work. So you won't show up, for example, like many clients do, um, show up, say, oh, I'm so busy. I'm sorry. I don't even know what to talk about. I can't think of anything to work on. Uh, I guess my life's okay. And it's a waste of just chatting. So it's to go both ways. And then from there, you can the client. Other they have an an agreement. They are expectations of other people, and that's a wonderful thing. To be able to teach a client the value of clear, strong, co-authored, collaborative agreement with other people in their world. Uh. So what what would be right for a coach to do in a case where where a client uh, let's say it's an oral agreement between the client and the coach and uh, he, the client uh, understands everything but for some reason he, he doesn't stick to his agreement and let's say after a couple of months he realizes and he comes back and he wants to continue with the coaching. So, or, or what would be the right way uh, when he actually discontinues and let's say he comes back after a while. So how, how does a coach handle this situation? Well, um, I is radical honesty about how important is it in the client's life that the client be able to match his behavior with his word. So if a client says, I will do this, you can count on me. This is a promise. Does he keep his promise? Mm. Does she keep her promise? Does he say, I will be home at six for dinner and wander in at seven and wonder why his wife is a little frustrated? Uh, where is he breaking his word in the world? So we, we need to take it very seriously. That's the most important place we can start. That's where Steve Hardison started with me. He said, if, in, if your life is to change, your word has to, to become sacred. It has to mean something when you speak to someone else. You have to speak reality into existence not just some vague promise that will be broken the minute you you they are out of your mind and so that's a very important part of a client relationship because it can change their entire life and and it starts with the coach and the client you will show up on time 
and you will not cancel sessions. And if you are unwilling to learn to do that, I can't work with you because your word means nothing. How can we work together when your speech, your communication has no meaning? Uh, Steve, uh, uh, just just a few just a few months ago, I was interviewing Clay Musk. Uh, Clay has also been working with Steve for thirteen years, and he has been coaching with him. And I asked him, like, uh, Clay, if if I would ask you, what have you been learning from Steve Hardison for thirteen years? <laughs> and you know, uh, it's close to I think. Uh, one year that I've been traveling with Steve Hardison and and uh, of course I know like you know I have learned a lot <laughs> and and I have I've become a different person and I'm becoming I'm changing every new day with every phone call that I have with him with every conversation that I have with him and and uh, I asked him Clay if I ask you to sum up like everything, all these 13 years of journey with him, that what have you learned from Steve Hardison? He said, Ranjan, I can, I can sum up the entire story of 13 years of my learning in three words. And it's, I've learned, or I am still learning how to be my word. Yes, that's good. That's very insightful. It is so it is so simple and so obvious that uh, we in our and people the news prints something and they don't even know if it's true. And people speak and they make promises that deep down they know they probably won't keep. And so uh, that's where life falls apart civilized life falls apart and so it is so basic but the learning um and i've been with with hardison for 30 some years not not 13 he's just beginning uh it, it is the upper level of learning is infinite it isn't like oh i finally have it good i'm good to go because when I he called me and asked me if I would read the book for the third time for me because mm. I read I read it in manuscript mm. and I read it when it came out. And he said, "What well, are you willing to read it again from a different perspective?" And I said, "Okay." And then I thought, "What can I? I already, what can I learn by reading it for a third time? What what is? But I have learned to trust." His request, his recommendations, and his requests. Mm. I've also learned that when I tell him I'm going something, I'm I do it. The third time, all of a sudden, I saw things in the book I hadn't seen. Well, how did that get in the book? Put that in there when I was not looking, and so all new insights started to drop for me. So. So the continuous learning, yes, it's basic. Be your words. Speak reality into existence. Uh, create the life you want instead of reacting to life. See, before I met him, I reacted to everything. Oh, no. How do I cope with this? How do I deal with being a single dad? How do I cope with that? And it was just total victim reacting to the outside world. And he said, why don't you create the world? And I said, oh, I would love to, but uh, how do you do that? And he said, by keeping your word, by speaking speaking into existence what you're committed to creating, a new relationship with your teenage daughter. Um, create that. Don't hope for it. Mm -hmm. And so that that's the power of word. It's creativity. Yes. So what are you creating now, Steve? I know you won't stop creating. So what are you creating? I am curious to know. Yes, I'm creating a new group of graduate students 
from my coaching school, which I had for many years, and the graduates come back and do a graduate class, and we are doing a new class on the subject of creativity. So that's that's fun for me and enjoyable. I'm creating and I'm writing a new book, and um, and that's it. And I create every new coaching, every new coaching session that I have with someone is a brand new creation. It's not. I don't try to coach in a structured way where I just have the same old questions and same old stories. I try to explore new territory with my clients. So it's all created. It's all creativity. Steve, uh, you know, you know, uh, coaching is also kind of, you have a perception that it's a very serious business and, you know, <laughs> and we have, and I, 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 when I saw your earlier conversations and I, I know like you, uh, you have a fun side of, of, of you know, enjoying what you're doing and, and the element of fun being added. And I've seen your conversation with Jason Goldberg and uh, you having created a lot of work with fun. So I would want you to, I would want to learn something about the fun, having the fun element in your life yes. as well as coaching. Yes, it's, it's very important because when we are lighthearted and, um, are enjoying life, seeing the humor in situations. Um, the more more of the brain is flashing and working. There are more lights on in the house up here. When I'm super serious and taking myself seriously and taking life serious too seriously, um, I'm not creative anymore. I'm not innovative. I'm not thinking of... Uh, a fun new solution to a problem. So there is a there is a function of humor and fun that is very positive. Um, and not that there aren't situations that are serious, like depression and debt, and uh, the situation might be serious, but the person can deal with it in a more lighthearted way. And and the more lighthearted you are the more um, new ideas you'll have moment to moment. Thank you so much, Steve. I'm sure many of us would love to learn from you is, you know, we have, there is on the one side we have coaching and the other, other side we have the business of coaching. And, and somewhere, you know, <laughs> people even who love coaching, they're scared about the business of coaching, the business side of coaching. So I know it, it would take it could take hours for you to, uh, you know, you could speak for us, but in, in, a, in a short time, what can you help us understand about how to find the alignment between coaching and the business side of coaching? Yes, you're correct. To, to the short answer, is to take the love of coaching and super permeate the business side of coaching so there's no difference. Mm. So, so that um, enrolling clients, bringing clients in, the business side of coaching is acquiring clients. Have conversations with clients be as fulfilling and enjoyable as conversations with the two they are the same activity and that solves the problem of hating liking it pretending I'm not good at business having money fear I'm in love with every aspect of this side of the business not just that side and it takes some for some people it takes time to learn to fall in love with every aspect of the coaching business and have it be the same thing conversation here conversation there that's all it is mm. 
It's no, it's no more. We make it complicated. Oh, money. Oh, survival. Oh, uh, ego, self-esteem, uh, rejection. No, it's love of conversation, love of conversation, both sides. Mm. Steve, is it, is it, has it something to do with only belief system or, or, a, or a wrong perception about that? Or is it about yeah. lack of skill? What, what, what do you think it is actually? All three. Mm. belief system i have a belief system that is negative and inaccurate doesn't match up with reality i have lack of skill i have not practiced saying my fee mm. i have not practiced uh so it's the skill that comes from practice you're right that's a good element belief systems that are negative and inaccurate don't harmonize with reality and perception as uh, money as evil see the exchange of money for service as awkward and hard to do that's a problem i can change thank you so much steve it truly was an enriching conversation with you. I loved talking to you. And uh, where where are you now in your journey with Steve Harrison? My last question. Uh, because we live very far apart now, uh, I don't see him as often as I would like to. But, but he's a dear friend. Um, we often talk on the phone. And he sends me private messages all the time so we are in constant touch constant uh connection but i don't i don't do the full coaching sessions as often sometimes i do i fly out i need your help let's meet but um uh he's he's just a dear friend and he's like the lighthouse and i'm in a ship on choppy waters in the dead of night and uh and he's always there and you both have created miracles for thousands across the world steve i am most grateful and I'm, I'm very thankful to have you both in my life and it is a dream come true and and even uh, i told steve harrison that nobody knew that right from when i declared the ultimate experience india and we were we, i was creating a list of speakers i knew for sure that i wanted to have you as a keynote speaker and uh, I, I i i never told this to anybody not even my team and nobody knew that you are going to be the keynote speaker i wanted to have you for some reason, I knew that I was so connected with your work and uh, that you are a gift to the world. You are a gift to life and you're a gift to me. And I told Steve Hardison that I want Steve Hart and Steve Chandler as the keynote speaker. And he said, sure, let's create it. <laughs> and, and, and he created you for me and you created a magnificent beginning of the ultimate experience, India, and a lot of value great value in my life thank you so much thank you, thank thank you, you. so much i love you i love you i love you steve and steve <laughs> likewise thank you so much thank you so much for being on my show moments with masters you truly are a master thank you <laughs> <laughs>